welcome back to episode five of this accessory show, where this episode we're going to teach you how to put the lotion on the skin or else you get the hose again. <laughs> Puts the lotion on the skin. We've been watching a lot of Sansa Lands, Hannibal, and Red Dragon this last couple weeks. Well, that and the title of the episode is Motion is Lotion. Motion so, is indeed lotion. So we're going to teach you how or else you'll get the hose again. <laughs> <laughs> what do they say it's not the size of the boat, it's the motion of the ocean? Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna get them all out right now. Uh, something like that. But episode five of the Successory Show, motion is lotion. It is indeed. But yes, we have been watching a lot of um, Silence of the Lambs. We just finished watching Cannibal just now. And you know, I just feel like as far as cannibal type movies go, nothing else has really been able to uh, do these movies justice. No, you just can't make eating people that interesting without Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> He's so suave. <laughs> so debonair. Although the TV show did fall short after season two. Yeah. I mean, like, Texas Chainsaw last year was the one where he was, like, cooking the people. The chili, the chili lady. People. Yeah, yeah, it's not the same. Yeah, well, that's because it's not, like, the main focus. Like, the main focus of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is that there's this uh, maniac wearing someone else's face chasing you with a chainsaw. See, see, there's maniac, and then there's psychopath, who may also be a sociopath, and it's just beautifully blended together. He actually makes me want to try some brains, eating them, not having them, but clearly don't. <laughs> That's something that I feel like we should like, cut out of the podcast. <laughs> highly questionable decision-making skills, but as usual, we are highly caffeinated as well because of you know, highly caffeinated conversations. What are you drinking today? Uh, radical Skedaddle Bang. Mm. I've got the Rockstar Thermo Neon Blast. Really hard to find around here lately, but it's probably their best flavor. Uh, that's just one of my favorites, I think, in general. It's just so good. It's All delicious. Right. So while we're on this momentum streak here, motion is lotion. It's something I say often in a lot of posts when I talk about people who are stagnant or they've hurt themselves and you want to lubricate a joint. So let's say you strained your back or you strained your pec. You know, of course I have a pec there. You want to constantly keep moving. So everyone says, how long should I wait before I start the rehab process or you know, what should I do in between them? It's like, you should keep moving because the more you move, the better you're going to keep moving because an object in motion tends to stay in motion. It just changes the loading parameters and that happens in life as well. You know, uh, a year ago or so before I moved up here, I usually kept like six or seven clients at a training person still. So I at least had something to do Monday through Saturday. I wasn't at home all the time like I am now. It was a significant change, but that motion got me out of bed in the morning, got me showered, got me moving, got me on my schedule. That started my motion so my day was productive and going. That was the biggest, hurdle for me when I moved up here is not having that. It's something we talked about when you first moved here because you're like had the same thing. You changed it to where you had your day job and your day job became this now coaching people online. You had to create infrastructure for you to follow or else it was easy to get behind and easy to get overwhelmed. So it starts with the first part of the day which is when the alarm goes off in the morning. And that's the first start of our motion. The alarm goes off and we do whatever and we have our morning routines that are slightly different. You know her morning routine is taking care of the social media work. My morning routine is answering emails, checking financial stuff and getting programming done before we get to social media and stuff like that. But that's my motion start. And for a lot of people, Stacy talks about it often, and it comes from a, a military general, making your bed. Mm -hmm. Making your bed is the first one of the day, it starts your day. So to me, motion is lotion is just always about being in some type of progressive motion, regardless of the outcome that you can't control. But if you're constantly moving forward, you're going to get further in life. Yeah. And it can be so simple, the tasks such as making your bed or brushing your teeth or getting up consistently at the same time every single day, that starts your motion. And whether, even if you've hurt yourself, motion is lotion. You don't want to sit there and say, woe with me, or be stagnant and constantly thinking about a problem. And start working towards that solution, and it's moving. Any forward progress is going to get you forward. I mean, that sounds so cliche and so simple, but it really is true. If you're sitting still, you're accomplishing nothing. Sitting is quitting. Yeah, um, taking it from like a more like specifically practical thing with motion is lotion is usually used in coaching for something that you tweak. Like, uh, I just watched Trevor tear his pec, and instead of like sitting on the bench and being like, damn, this really sucks, or I, don't, I can't do anything now, I'm bummed, what am I going to do with the meat, blah, 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 he instantly like went over and grabbed a band and started pumping blood into it. So it's the same thing, like someone, if, if I'm coaching someone and they tell me, oh, I think I tweaked my back, and then they go to sit down or lay down. That's like the last thing that you want to do. You want to keep getting move, movement to it. I just had a girl who's actually overseas today. Um, and she mentioned that she hurt her back and that she didn't know if she'd be able to lift today, but that she would try tomorrow. 
And I instantly told her, I was like, walk, do something that actually gets movement to that area because if it's stagnant, it's just gonna start to hurt more. So practical wise, motion is lotion in injury prevent, not prevention, but injury um, rehab kind of. But in life, I feel like a lot of people get stuck in this mindset that they are like at a plateau mm -hmm. and they feel like, well, I'm not making any progress. So I'm going to change like 47 different things and, you know, throw shit at the wall and hope something sticks. And they're not getting any progress because they're not like, they're not actually aiming for anything. If they're just trying to change 47 different things and trying to just desperately like cling for a win. Um, with training or with life, business, relationships, anything like that, like you do sometimes have to find a win, even if it's something small. And I always use Dawn as this example because uh, Dawn is my crier with my lifting. <laughs> and she spent probably like a solid two weeks just having like shit session after shit session. And mind you, this is like shit session in her eyes. She really wasn't doing a bad job. She was just like struggling a little bit more than usual. And she was ending every session with crying. So, uh, you know, like a week or two goes by and we're just, we keep having conversation and talking about it and trying to figure out like what's really stressing her out. And eventually she finished the session and she's like, oh, but I didn't cry today. And I'm like, well, that's a, that's a win. That's a major win because that means that you are on the right path and gaining more momentum because motion is lotion towards more goals. After that day, she started getting more comfortable, more confident under the barbell again and having better sessions. So trying to find small wins in order to gain that momentum and get the ball rolling and keep it going, you do have to just try to find, sometimes you just have to find something that makes you feel good about where you're at, like your progress, instead of feeling like you're at a plateau all the time. And do that consistently. I mean, that's, that's the big key is being consistent with anything you do. Like you talked about not trying 47 different things. If you only have one task to do, do the absolute best you can at that task and then move on to the next task and you're going to get better along the way. But if you're doing 47 different tasks, you're spreading that thin, you're not going to be as great as you can at 47 different things as you could be at one, two, or three things. So it's narrowing your focus, but always moving forward towards them. And that starts with you know having structure, having a schedule, never sitting still. Uh, like there's a Henry Rollins quote somewhere, it's like free time is worth exactly what you paid for it or something like that, which means it's worthless. <laughs> be productive with your time and there are times where you're using that we'll watch a movie every now and again that's our entertainment that's our mental break but I'm the kind of person who likes to work seven days a week all hours of the day because I feel like I'm productive and when I'm productive I'm happy and when I'm happy usually means my clients are also happy and life is good in that direction because I have purpose whereas if I'm sitting still and doing absolutely nothing I'm unhappy I'm miserable I'm not purposeful and that's because I'm stuck I'm stuck sitting still instead of creating that momentum and they can be so small those momentous things like we talked about making your bed, or now I've got to the point where I get up and pee a lot because I'm caffeinated, and sitting in that chair being stagnant, now ever I've made a rule that every time I pee, I have to do one mobility movement. So because I'm sitting in the chair almost all day, and I pee like every hour and a half, or every hour, every time I get up and pee, I'm having a motion is lotion moment, and I'm doing a mobility movement, whether that be wall slides, single leg RDLs, 90 90 hip switches, it switches every time, but I make sure that I, instead of using the chair as an excuse, like, oh, this chair is killing my posture and killing my lips, I'm taking responsibility for it and my motion is lotion moment is when I get up to pee, I'm doing a mobility movement. 10 reps of something. No, non-negotiable. Made it non-negotiable so if I don't do it, it's my fault. I'm taking accountability for that. Yeah, I do think that like people lack the initial first step a lot of the times. Like they, they want something, right? So they have X goal and they want that thing but then they just kind of hope that it makes its way to them, you know, like they're like, oh, well, if I want this thing hard enough and I think about it hard enough and I talk about it enough, I'm going to get it. That generally never happens. Like, yes, you can speak things into existence in a way, but most people that are actually speaking things into existence are actually taking those baby steps or those large steps in order to, uh, like, manifest that thing. So if you have a goal and you want that thing, but you're sitting on your ass twiddling your thumbs hoping it'll just come to you, you're never going to gain that momentum that you're looking for in order to even like cross that task off your list. Same thing with something very simple as making the bed. The bed's not gonna make its damn self. Like you have to actually <laughs> do that, you know? So that's part of your productivity for the day is, you know, like if you make your bed and you instantly are a little bit more productive because you're like, oh, I checked one thing off the list and then you go downstairs and you make your breakfast and that's another thing off the list because you followed your meal plan. Like that's two things done and you've only been awake 20 minutes. It's so like that's already momentum for your day. So keep that up. And I know that like 
Sometimes the hardest part of the day is something as simple as making your bed or making breakfast. Mm -hmm. I hate making breakfast every day. I don't know why it's my least favorite meal to make. I make all, all my meals fresh because I'm weird like that. I don't like Tupperware stuff. But making breakfast is the hardest thing. I'd rather like just drink my coffee and not do that. But if I start breakfast, that means that it starts my other things too. So I start breakfast and then I'll like take out the recycling or I'll wash the dishes that are in the sink or like do whatever, like small, minute tasks that take me two or three minutes. And by the time I've sat down to have my breakfast, I've already crossed four to five things off my to-do list to do. So action is always going to be the first thing that you need in order to even check the smallest thing off your list. So stop twiddling your thumbs. Take your, take your thumb out of your ass. And like, <laughs> get moving. But for some people, they really enjoy that thumb in there. <laughs> That's for other times. No, other times. Small wins uh, create big momentum. I really like what you were saying there because you were talking about, you know, making the bed, doing the dishes, making breakfast, putting things in a recycle. Those seem small and trivial, but when you start adding them up and you've accomplished 15 things in the first hour of the day, that's a hell of a lot of momentum. You feel ride. good. You feel good when you've done all that. I mean, everyone feels good when their house is clean. Everyone feels good when they've organized things. You know, it's a fresh start. So I look at it as it's not just motion is lotion, but decluttering your day. Because the more you've achieved in the first hour of the day, the less you have to do as the day wears on and we get more tired. Like we actually used to start this podcast We'd be, we'd be recording like Sunday night at like 8 or 9 o'clock. We'd be freaking tired. <laughs> I'm answering questions on the phone and watching videos. We had to, you know, do it. We went on a trip last Sunday. We ended up doing it Monday morning, first thing. And we were so much more energetic as I was like, okay, we're going to do this early now. And this is part of our momentum is filming the podcast earlier in the day when we're more energetic and have more to say as opposed to fatigue and tired nights. We can bring you more value, more content, and so forth. And because we're more hilarious. It's, Debatable. <laughs> I mean, I'm always hilarious, but you know, you, I don't know, we'll see. But, <laughs> but it's one of those things where it's, the more you can accomplish earlier in the day, the easier it is the rest of the day because it's less overwhelming to you. And that's what happens with so many people and they're asking basic questions like, how should I eat for meat? How should I eat for the day? How should I pack my, my things for, for work? Uh, what do I need to bring with me on meat day? These are questions of, of overwhelmed. This is somebody who's overwhelmed by the process because they haven't prepared for it. Your day shouldn't be any different than every other day if you plan and prepare and follow a checklist mentality of what have I already accomplished and then everything else is easy. So like Riley said, she has it mentalized now because she does it every day, but figure out everything you do within a normal day and start making it so you have a timeline that I need to get all of this done by 11 a.m. or 12 p.m., whatever time I want. But if you can get all of it done in the first four hours of the day, you can enjoy whatever you want the rest of the day and you don't feel guilty about it because you've got everything done. That's your morning motion. You know, motion is lotion and your day is easier. If you want to watch Netflix at night, you can because you've got everything else done. Mm -hmm. You know, you've earned your time. So I just look at it as like make a checklist, earn your time, accomplish things, don't put them off because why put off today what you can get, or why put off or tomorrow what you can get done today kind of mentality is mine. You know? uh, also sometimes those like small menial tasks are the ones that like break the camel's back. Like if I have six different things to do that are uh, higher stress, like maybe it's programming or designing or something like that, and I know that I have like dishes to do, I'm gonna feel so overwhelmed because I have those extra like small little things to do like dishes or meal prep or something small. So if I can like, if I can streamline everything in order to get me the most things done at one time, I will. Like most of the time, um, like I mentioned, I don't like to meal prep things. Like I just hate Tupperware food. I'm so weird. I'm so sorry, Paul, that I make traveling <laughs> so difficult because I just don't, I don't want to reheat beef and rice. Like that's just disgusting to me. I just don't like it. Whatever. That's fine. But, uh, you know, like what I'm doing, like while I make a meal is not just make a meal. Like, so if I'm making steak or chicken, that's not the only thing I'm doing. Like I may be prepping rice. Rice is one thing that I will eat out of Tupperware. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> like, so I might be prepping up like, uh, three cups of rice and like the rice cooker and doing that. And one other thing while I'm cooking. So I try to find times where I can accomplish more than one task at a time because it makes everything else easier for me. Like I have to get up because of the way that I am. I will have to get up every two and a half to three hours to cook a meal and that puts an interruption in my programming or my designing. So it like interrupts my flow a little bit. But if I'm accomplishing two to three things while I'm cooking, then I don't feel so overwhelmed when I go back to work. So I may cook and check my messages and like knock out like two or three messages responses there so that way 
it's less to do when I sit back down and have to focus on programming again or designing again or whatever it is. So if you can find ways to kind of like streamline your process, that makes it a little bit easier to keep that momentum also. And you, you streamline your own process with it. Like we know the day before what meals we're going to have when. So even though Riley insists on cooking everything fresh, which I'm benefiting from because it's delicious, but she knows what meals we're going to have at what time. So we eat on a routine time and we plan the day ahead. She takes out the chicken or she takes out the, the tuna steak that she has or she takes out the, the uh, actual steak with no strips if we're going to have that for lunch or dinner or whatever. So she knows what needs to be the process and when it's being cooked. So she streamlines the process by preparing the day before ahead of time. So the end of the next day is the day before is where she takes everything out and says what we're going to have, boom, boom, boom. So even though she adds the extra five to ten minutes to her day each meal, of preparing and cooking it, she's already planned ahead of what she's going to have. There's never reaching by chance and saying, well, what do we have? We know what we have, we're prepared for it, and, and she's got that point where if we're running low, it's like, okay, this is what we need to get from the store the next time we go. That list is always created ahead of time. Preparation is the most important thing to keep momentum going, is not having to go by chance and say, what do I do? Like she mentioned quickly, we're traveling next week for a meet, and so it actually does Paul a favor instead of her freaking out when she's already there. She's planning for ideas and suggestions of what she can do while we're already traveling for that so she can stay on task. That's a whole week in advance she's planning that out. If you're waiting for the day before, you're already too late. Yeah, I'm, I might be like slightly, slightly neurotic about <laughs> planning. Um, I accept that about myself and I'm okay with it. And it also benefits me like in instances like this when we are traveling because I don't have to worry about it. Like I, I know that I will pack like if I have to bring a protein bar or something, or um, I'll eat oats, like cold overnight oats or whatever, I'll eat that. So I know what I will and won't eat or what I will and won't abide to. So those are the things that I will be doing when I travel. So just make it, you, you have to know yourself. Make it easier on yourself. Take the first step in order to establish like an initiative towards reaching that goal. And once you take that first step, it's easier to take your second and your third and your fourth. So it's just finding that momentum. Lotion is lotion. Lotion is lotion. Any movement is going to bring you in the right direction. Just keep moving. Stay moving. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the stay woke. <laughs> stay woke. Stay fresh, stay woke. <laughs> but more important, stay moving. <laughs> Head on a swivel. <laughs> All right. We did have a question this week, which I thought was a super cool and very in-depth, like, psychological question. Riley does not agree at all. We've, like, figured about this a little bit. Well, it's, it's more of, like, the responses <laughs> with it. Uh, yeah. Well, so the question was... Of anyone in the world at any point in time, who would you love to have lunch with? And the most important thing to me was why. He's like, why would you want to have lunch with this person? And instantly I had two answers of who I wanted to sit with and why I wanted to have lunch with them and what I wanted to take from them. And then we got some like stock answers, which you would expect, you know, my wife, my boyfriend. Uh, Wong had one funny that Riley doesn't want me to say on the podcast, but it was hilarious. <laughs> well, first off, you said that you weren't going to say who said it. So oh, now you okay. have to say it. So now you, so are, you have to say it now. I'm not saying it. I'm not saying it. I'm keeping it a copacetic and happy, but it was funny. But um, I look at it like very in-depth because it's an opportunity. And that's what I see is the opportunity to meet or do anything possible in the world. And I think a lot of people are inhibited by fear, so they gave very, very easy answers or they didn't really reach out and say who they wanted to meet and why, because that means putting yourself out of your comfort zone. It's easy to have lunch with someone you already know, you, you're familiar with them, that's a familiarity, versus someone you don't know, have never met, you have to then prepare like questions or topics or wonder how they're gonna judge you. So I always saw that as people being fearful of an opportunity, but those are people who aren't going to take risks, or aren't gonna step out of their comfort zone because of course it makes them uncomfortable. And I'll just say, you know, Right away, I'm like, I wanted to meet Warren Buffett, have lunch with him, and Vince McMahon. Two very polarizing figures and opposite ends of the spectrum. But Warren Buffett has been the most successful investor, but that's not why I want to meet him. Despite being, at many times, the richest man in the world, he doesn't care to spend any of it. He doesn't give a shit about the amount of money he has. He buys used hailstorm damaged cars. He'll go to Derek Queen again Sunday. He'll play bridge every weekend with his friends. And he reads like five to six hours all day of biographies and business and newspapers. He's donating 95% of his income after death to charity. Like it wasn't about the money. It's he probably has the best understanding of value. Mm -hmm. He knows inherently what he values. He values having a Coca-Cola every day, having a Sunday every day, having a steak every day, and playing bridge with his friends. That just happens to be his job. He doesn't value the money or the income he's earned, which is why he's giving it all away. And he values the people and the simple things around him. So here's someone who could be spoiled by all the benefits life has given him, doesn't care. All he sees in life is value and, that, and the actual value of people, which is why I'd like to meet him because that's somebody who can teach me how to value more from my life and maybe show me things that I'm not seeing that are incredibly valuable that I should really focus on. And the other was someone like Vince McMahon, which is not, that's more of like a leadership and courageous thing. Uh, Vince McMahon obviously owns the WWE. I was a big fan when I was a kid. I watched it all the time. And it was huge 
then and it's even bigger now as far as the financial aspect of it, but every failure he's had has been a public failure. Uh, the XFL failed twice. The World Bodybuilding Federation failed. The ICO Pro Sports Supplement failed. Running for office failed. Uh, being brought up on charges, you know, things like that, like disgrace. Everything he's done has been a complete public failure and he couldn't care. He couldn't care less, he keeps trying. And not only does he try, his family comes along with him on that journey. His son and daughter work in the business, they're both independent outside of the business. His son owns a cloud computing company which is growing every day, uh, Shane McMahon. And the wife has like political ambition, she's involved in different organizations things. I just think it's really cool how not only is he willing to try everything, but they're willing to get on camera and do things as a family together. And that's, that to me seems like leadership. You know, here's what we're gonna do, here's the risk that's involved, let's all do it together. And he's still like jacked at like 75 years old, which is cool too, so he's a lifter, so we have a lot in common. But I imagine the stories would be great, but I, I just understand he has courage to teach people, but leadership, because it's all in one family that he's doing that, which I think is really cool. Because most of us come from like broken families or disorderly things. We didn't have that patriarch figure to teach us how to be a community. And one of my big tasks is creating a community around me that I can elevate everybody with myself. And I think that's something he does exponentially well, which is why I want to learn from him. You had someone too you wanted to have lunch with, uh, yeah, mine's like a little bit less of a public figure. Um, my my grandma's who raised me, and she died when I was ten on Christmas. Happy Christmas, Merry Christmas to me. Um, so it would probably I would probably want to have lunch with my grandma again because she she was kind of the person who made me more of who I am and more like self assured in myself, and she was really really good at teaching me that I wasn't restricted on doing what I wanted to do because of who I am, um, more in like the strong female kind of uh, role model that I didn't really have. She did not give one shit about anything that anyone thought of her, like not even the slightest bit. Um, she, you know, she wasn't like overly feminine. She was a landscaper, she worked with her hands, she built everything for herself. Um, she was, she lived by herself, she was single. Um, you know, she took me to every volleyball game that I had that I ever had. Um, she just kind of taught me the value of like working hard. Like I would often go with her landscaping and like just do whatever. And I just thought it was cool because she wasn't, you know, forcing me to like wear a dress if I didn't want to. Like I would go to like my other grandparents' house and they'd tell me to put on a dress and like look cute and whatever. And I get to this grandma's house and she'd be like, you want to put on your jeans or you want to put on your shorts and like we can go outside and like mow the grass or something you know like she just didn't didn't give a shit about conventional things that back then girls were supposed to do and i think that that really instilled something in me that like i can be dominant or i can be aggressive in fields that aren't predominantly women already like i get asked about coaching a lot uh, there's not a lot of really really popular female strength coaches or at least not any that are getting like good sort of reputations right there are some great ones. Um, I can think of a couple off the top of my head that are really good, but I am doing really, really well in a field that is not meant for women specifically, or has not always thought about being meant for women. So just being able to have lunch with her again and kind of like reaffirm the confidence that I should have in myself would be like really probably beneficial for me at this point, especially since I'm trying to um, expand my brand and be my own person. And getting her insight and like that little bit of uh, I don't give a fuck kind of attitude of hers like rubbing off on me would be really really cool some days because like that's hard to come by sometimes is especially when your life is broadcasted on social media like 24/7. Yeah. Um, so that's who I would choose, and it's not because I think that she has like some secret answer that I don't have because inherently I know that all the questions I have about my life I have the answers to. Someone else doesn't have the answers for me. I have those answers, but it would just be nice to get someone's perspective um, on something that I'm doing that maybe they've done better or they've done before. And like, we did get some pretty good answers that were kind of similar to that, where they were looking for other people for answers. Um, Yours is an example of an opportunity that's no longer there. Mm -hmm. You know, she died when you were very young, unfortunately, at 10, and you don't have the opportunity. So that's what you're longing for is that opportunity to speak with her again because she was so influential in your life. That's why I like the question so much because it, it showed 
the insights of someone, what they're looking for. And some of the answers that people gave really lined up with someone. I know Tracy had mentioned a, uh, the first person to receive, like the first airman to receive the Medal of Honor or something yeah. like that. Yeah, uh, John Chapman. John Chapman. The first Medal of Honor ever recorded on video. Right, and it's like pers- she's going through some adversity right now and she was finding strength in his ability to overcome. And like she said, it was very, very life-changing and inspirational to her. So oftentimes, it's, if you think about that simple question of who you want to have lunch with and why, it could be, what are you looking for? You know, you were looking for one last opportunity to spend time with someone you love because that opportunity is gone. And I was looking for, obviously, leadership and somebody to teach me more about understanding value in life, not necessarily in assets, which is important because we can get lost in assets and, and away from life. So leadership and life value was very, very important to me right now in my life. These are the things I'm looking for. We had interesting ones. You can kind of get a picture of what people are struggling with because we had people talk about Winston Churchill, mm-hmm. who constantly talked about adversity. You know, he's very famous for saying, if you're going through hell, keep going. Motion is lotion. It all ties together here. <laughs> you know, I have that saved in my phone, that background where it's like a screenshot of it. If you're going through hell, keep going. And that was his thing is everybody in life is going to have those down moments and those tough times. It's like you just keep walking forward. And again, he had the same philosophy. You're going to find your way out of it. Um, I just texted somebody the other day. There's a quote in the Shawshank Redemption where he climbs through the sewer tunnel of poop. And the quote in the movie is sometimes you've got to crawl through a mile of shit just to come out clean on the other side. And that's just kind of how life is. You know, you're going to have your up moments and your down moments. Who are some of the other ones we had? Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, so someone who's highly motivated, a go-getter, tough as nails because he wants to absorb as much as he can. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had MLK and Malcolm X to get their true wisdom on things since everyone loves to twist their words, which is very fitting for kind of what we're going through in the Absolutely world right now. Absolutely pertinent right now. Um, actually, someone said, us too. Because, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> because we're fun, positive, informative, and we like food. Um, this is true. Another one was Robin Williams to get a better understanding of mental health. And probably the most important answer of all, aside from Jordan Long's, was Chris Farley. (laughs) Absolutely. You're not going to get that opportunity again. If you want to have lunch with Chris Farley, it means now you're just putting on a video of like Tommy Boy or, you know, Beverly Hills Ninja, something. Yeah. So uh, So a lot of those were opportunities lost or uh, the one about Robin Williams understanding mental health. That was a really introspective one because here's someone on the outside who was smiling and his whole job was to entertain and make us laugh. When on the inside, he was dying. You don't know what someone's going through until you sit down and talk to them. And even the people closest to him didn't know what he was going through because he kept it inside. So. I do think that um, with this this question specifically, like I mentioned earlier, is like people are looking for answers to their problems that they think lie within other people. Mm-hmm. Um, like, you know, with Robin Williams, like if you're going through your own mental health issues, you want to talk to someone who struggled as well, but they don't have the same answers that you do and they likely don't have the same problems that you do. Um, they could be similar, but they're not going to be the exact same problem. So getting someone else's perspective on things is generally helpful. Um, but I do think that people discount themselves when it comes to being able to answer the questions that they already know the answer to. And like, let's be honest, if you're going to ask someone a question, you generally already know the answer, or at least you know what you should be doing, or you know what you want the answer to be. And, um, I've had many conversations with people who asked me a question where I knew that they already knew the answer and they just wanted me to reaffirm um, what they wanted and I don't do that. (laughs) So if you want um, false reaffirmation, I'm not the person to ask for it, I gave you the truth. So I think that people could stand to be a little bit more uh, forthright and more trusting in their own answers to their own questions because you do know the answers can't get them from someone else you can't fake the answer you can't change the answer like whatever the answer is to the question that you have you already have it within you right so I think that that's important too um, is to recognize that not no one situation or no situations are ever exactly unique or exactly identical everyone's situations are unique so trying to mold your life off of someone else's or mold your life based off of someone else's success will never be uh, the way to go, but it can show you how to fail, how to fail, or how to be better at failing, or to, how to be better at choosing that path towards success. That's a great example because you, you get that a lot from biographies. People talk about all their failures in life and their successes in life, and the whole goal from that is so you learn from their failure, not learn from their success, because you may not be able to duplicate the same success, but you can learn not to make the same mistakes. Yep. And, uh, you know, history doesn't always repeat itself, but it sure does echo. And so it's, it's important to understand that, that if you're learning from somebody else's mistake, you're probably not going to make those same mistakes. And that's 
that's why we, we study these things, that's why we read biographies, and that's why it's important to ask yourself those questions. And I was able to identify in myself why I wanted to have lunch with those people. And Riley was able to identify in herself why she wanted to have lunch with that person. And that's a great question to ask yourself, is what do I need right now? And the answers may already be within you, but if you're looking to a certain direction, there's a reason for that. And some people took an easy road out. I know I'm gonna call you out. If you said your wife or your boyfriend, that's the easy road out. <laughs> They're already in your life. You can talk to them. You can pick up the phone and call them and talk to them anytime. You may not be able to sit down and have lunch with them, but you can talk to them at all times. Also, how are both of you prioritizing your time if you can't find like a half an hour in a day to spend lunch with them? Like that's that, true. You should do some self reflection. That's poor time management and poor, you know, poor structure of time. So, but it's one of those things of like, if you really want something, you're going to have to dig a little deeper and see how you can get it. And like Riley said, you already have the answers, but maybe you don't necessarily have the courage to pursue it. And that's why this is important about motion as lotions, because if you're even taking small steps, you're moving towards the goal. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how small the steps are, but if you start compounding small steps over time, they really freaking add up. You know, you may want something, but the steps are so huge, you're not gonna get it tomorrow. That doesn't mean you can't have it 10 years from now. And that's something that's really big in our sport is everybody wanting to have number one numbers by the year one of powerlifting. That's just not how it works. Um, there are people who have number one numbers and they've been doing this six, seven, eight years and they came from another sport where they were already lifting four or five years on top of that. So really that's 11 years of work. There is no such thing as an overnight success in any endeavor in life, and especially in powerlifting, because it's strength that's built and compounded over time. And those who stay healthiest the longest usually end up the strongest. So don't freaking rush the process, but do keep moving forward. Yeah. Or else you get the hose again. Or you get the hose again. Yeah. Oh so, boy. So follow our steps or you get the hose. Oh. Oh. I got a good hose. It's got like one of those little needle tip squares that's like really precise. No, the needle tip isn't on there right now. The needle it's tip in the garage. I have to figure out where it comes from. So true story, I am not manly in any way as far as like tools or things. This thing was on the garage floor and I like picked it up I'm like, what is this? And I was like, oh, that's the tip of the hose. I was like, really? <laughs> Shows you I have not watered many lawns in my life. <laughs> yeah, when, uh, when furniture gets built here, it's built by me. That's correct. <laughs> that's correct. And I am shameful. Maybe I should put Bob Bula on my lunch list. <laughs> this whole house, I can learn how to build things and use a tool. Uh, yeah. He's probably on my brother's list. <laughs> my brother loves tools. Yeah, basically, if we like have something that I can't build or like don't know how to do, we just call Trevor's brother. Yeah, Eric, I need to borrow a socket set, and he'll tell me like this one, that one, metric, imperial socket set. I'm like, I don't know, to bring them all. No, generally he's usually like, do you know how to use them? <laughs> <laughs> and then if the answer is no, he's like, all right, I'll bring them. Okay, all right. <laughs> that's great. You got anything else you want to add to that? No. All right. Well, thank you all. It's really cool that you guys share these. It's really, really overwhelming and, and appreciated. Uh, leave a five-star review that really helps us grow it. Share it with everyone you can that helps us grow it. And we post a question usually Friday or Saturday because we record mm -hmm. on Sunday. So it's interactive. And you can remain anonymous if you want. Just say, hey, please don't share my name with that. Uh, if you leave something really, really funny like Wong, I'm going to call you out for it. But, <laughs> but if Wong said, don't say my name, I wouldn't. But, <laughs> but I appreciate you all for interacting, sharing. It helps us tremendously. And if there's anything you want us to talk about or bring up, feel free to message us directly and let us know. Yep. Okay, see you next week for episode six. Bye.